Hello everyone, Bendy Bono here for another foray into the Zoom. I apologize about the glare from the window behind me. I uh, needed to move my desk and some other stuff around in my office. And unfortunately I don't have any blinds for that window at the moment. So uh, we will just deal with it the best it can we can. And if it looks terrible on the finished product, I will try to. You know what, I wonder if we could do this. Here we go. Oh, maybe that's better. Well, we'll deal with it for this time. And uh, if it looks terrible in the finished product, product, I will see what I can do. Uh, but you don't need to see me troubleshooting my bright window while I record this video. So we'll just roll with it for today. All right, so here we are. We are on question 31 of what belongs to the unity and plurality in God. Okay. So we've got four articles today, whether there is Trinity in God, whether the Son is other than the Father, whether the exclusive word alone should be added to the essential term in God, I'll explain what that means when we get there, and whether an exclusive diction can be joined to the personal term. Now before we dive into these, just one quick note by way of apology in advance. Uh, I wound up writing up these notes about three, four days ago, and just because of, you know, busyness and life and work and stuff, I have not been able to record the video until now. And given the complexity of the material, ho I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that not too much time has passed and, and that I'm not uh, overly rusty because of that. But if I am a bit, I apologize in advance and I'll do my best to uh, understand my own thoughts I noted down and explain them. All right. So Article 1, whether there is Trinity in God. Five objections here. Number one, every name in God signifies substance or relation. Trinity cannot signify substance or belong to each of the persons. In other words, the Father is not Trinity. He is uh, part of the Trinity, but you know he doesn't have his own Trinity in him. And it can't signify relation since it does not express a name that refers to another. Two, Trinity is a collective term. The unity of the collective is the least of unities, but well, God is the greatest possible unity. Uh, what that means is essentially, you know, any type of collection, like, you know, if I hold up uh, a couple of pens here, um, the, this, they're united in the sense it's a collection of pens, but they can very easily be disunited, so it's the least of all unities. Uh, whereas God is going to be the greatest possible unity. Trinity signifies triplicity. Triplicity cannot be in God since it is a kind of inequality. If Trinity is in God, it must exist in the unity of the divine essence. If this were true, there would be three essential unities in God, and that cannot be. Finally, if Trinity is in God, when the Trinity is tr then the Trinity is trine, which would mean that there are nine relations in God, and that is untrue. So in other words, that's saying if there's Trinity in God, uh, then everything in him has to be triplicated, I guess you'd say. Argument. Athanasius, in the Athanasian Creed, says uh, God is unity in Trinity, Trinity in unity. The argument. The name Trinity signifies the determinate number of persons. It adds specificity to the term plurality. So that's really all we're trying to accomplish with this word Trinity. It's one of those where the argument is, is very, very short, uh, and most of the argumentation is actually done with interacting with the objections. All right, apply to one. We use the term to mean the number of persons of one essence. As a substantial term, then, Trinity cannot be applied to each of the members since the members are one person, not three. So the term means the number of persons in the essence. As a relational term, it signifies not a relation itself, but the number of people related to each other. So Aquinas is saying, well, actually, you can use it in a sense as both a substantial and a relational term. All right. Number two. The Trinity is a collective, not in the sense implied by the objection, because it signifies not only it, meaning the Trinity, not the objection. The Trinity signifies not only a unity of order, which would be pens, right, but the unity of essence, which even though these are both pens, they do not have the same essence. Actually, one of them is a pencil, but we won't get stuck on those details. 
Okay, number three, Trinity signifies not triplicity, but the number of persons within God's plurality. The term Trinity places number not in the unity of the essence, but in the persons numbered within the unity. We do not say that Trinity is trine, as explained above. The word Trinity is not being used in that sense. Okay, so we can use the word Trinity with God, but then is the Son other than the Father? You know, really, and, and you might at this point be saying, well, haven't we already established that with some of the other questions? And yeah, kind of, but again, you know, this is the Summa Theologica. You know, it's not the, um, you know, he, he's, he's going to make sure we cover every possible angle here. And so that's what we're doing, okay? So yes, as we've seen before, you know, in the treaties on the one God, sometimes there is a bit of overlap. And, when that happens, rather than uh, feeling like we're just reading the same things over again, um, we should both be open to maybe some of the distinctions and look for them, and also be relieved that hopefully it's not a brand new, altered, confusing point, as so often happens in the Summa. Okay, objections, four of them. Other implies diversity of substance, but the divine persons do not have a diversity of substance. If the Son is other than the Father, he differs from him, and Ambrose teaches us that there is no diversity in the Godhead. Number three, the term other, which we have to understand the Latin term for the sake of this objection, and that is alias, is related to the word alien. Hillary tells us there is nothing alien in the divine persons. It's kind of an etymological argument. And then number four, the term other is the same as the term other thing. If the son is another person from the father, he is another thing as well. What Augustine tells us, the father, son, and Holy Spirit are one thing and other persons. Okay. When speaking of the Trinity, now this argument here, uh, we're going to get very into semantics. Okay, so this is a very technical from a semantic perspective argument. Uh, those can sometimes be a bit tiresome, but again, as he's going to explain right off the bat here, and we'll cover in just a, a second. Uh, it's very important in this case that we be careful and precise with our language. So, uh, Jerome teaches us that when we're talking about something like the Trinity, we have to be careful with our words and our semantics, because if we don't, heresy can arise when words are wrongly used. Okay? So, in avoiding heresy, you know, these two problems we've talked about before, Arianism and Sabellianism. Arianism, uh, again, the idea that the Son and the Spirit aren't really God, and Sabellianism that uh, the Son, the Spirit, and the Father are just three different modes of, of, the, of a single person in God. Okay, So to avoid Arianism, we do not use the terms diversity and difference in God. We instead use the term distinction. When the Church Fathers or other Orthodox works use terms like diversity or difference, we take them to mean distinction. In other words, we recognize that not every work from the church is necessarily going to be as careful and precise with its words uh, as we would maybe like. You know, and this is understandable, right? You know, you, 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 you might, in one type of argument, you might say, or one type of context, you might say the son is different than the father. Uh, and you might use that term because the argument or the context you're speaking into uh, doesn't require as high a degree of precision. For example, I've been, I, I teach middle school faith formation at my parish. We've been talking about the Trinity a little bit, you know, and there I'm trying to explain high level concepts. And if I start trying to get into the nitty gritty of diversity versus distinction or difference versus distinction, it's going to get lost, so in that context, those terms become interchangeable. And that doesn't mean that I'm attempting to promote heresy there, of course. Uh, and so what Thomas Aquinas is trying to say is that, uh, when it, that there might be stuff like that that takes place in authorized works from the church. Not that I'm an authorized work from the church or on the level of councils or, you know, the church fathers or whatever, but you know what I mean. Um that we have to understand that in some of those contexts, those words might be used interchangeably, but when we get into a real technical sense, which this is, uh, we need to understand the difference or the distinction between diversity, difference, and distinction. Okay. 
So similarity, we similarly we avoid terms like uh, discrepant, alien, separable, and disparity. Okay, and those would probably be more problematic uh, in any context. Right, they're not quite as interchangeable as those others. Then to avoid Sabellianism, we avoid terms like singularity and solitary. We avoid the term only as applied to God as a whole. We do not use it regarding the sun, since there is not a plurality of suns. In other words, we can say that there's singularity in the sun as the sun, but there's a singularity in God. Okay. Hillary teaches us that taken together, these two negations, remember we've talked about negative theology before, so I'm not going to rehash that right now. Let's see the previous video. So we take those two negations, says that what that, those come together to mean we confess neither a solitary nor a diverse God. Okay, we confess a God who is united in three persons, in Trinity. We use the term other than to get back to some of these objections up, or you know the whole you know this this term right here in, in the article we use that term other than to signify a distinction of suppositum and if you need a refresher on that term just check out the summa dictionary that i have linked to in the video description okay reply to number one in our objections the term other refers to a suppositum only uh, it's not referring to substance Number two is defined above, you know, in our, our argument, the term other does not mean a difference, but only a distinction. Number three, the two terms, meaning alias and alien, may be etymologically related, but we use only other, alias, and not alien. So, you know, a lot of terms have a, that's kind of a weak objection. You can see right off the bat there. I mean, there's a lot of terms that are linguistically related, but yet come to have very different meanings, okay? Um, Number four, other thing replies uh, applies to form or essence. Oh, I think I meant applies. Sorry about that. That's what I'm saying where it's been, you know, a bit too long since I wrote up these notes. Other thing, that term, other thing applies to form or essence. Other person refers to a distinction in one essence, at least in this case. All right, article three, whether the exclusive word alone should be added to the essential term in God. Aristotle will understand a bit more rather than try and explain that off the bat. Well, what exactly that means will become clear through the course of the article, so just stick with me for a second here. All right, objections. Uh, number one, Aristotle says that we use the term alone to signify someone who is not with another. God is with the angels and souls of saints. And whatever is said of God essentially is predicated of every person in of the Trinity, but we cannot say... The Father is God alone, thus we cannot use the term alone for God. Okay, so now it's starting to come into focus. Uh, what this is essentially asking is when we say to God, you know, you are the only God or you are God alone, is given what we're saying about the Trinity, is that an acceptable thing to say? Okay, if we use the term alone as referring to the persons, we would say that God is Father alone, and this cannot be, since man is also a father. If we use it essentially, then by saying God alone creates, we would have to say that the Father alone creates, which cannot be. All right, 1 Timothy 1.17, you know, any number of verses in the Bible on this, God is the only God. So, Scripture, Church Fathers, Church Teaching uses exclusive diction it uses the word alone only all that fun stuff to refer to God all right now we get into two fun terms categorical and sync categorical these are different types of words and then big big words simple meanings okay categorical words can stand on their own and be meaningful if I say dog you can form an image in your head of what I'm talking about. If I say elephant, you know, you think of an elephant. On the other hand, syncategorical words aren't like that. Uh, to, in order to be meaningful, they have to be joined to other words. So if I say and, it doesn't really have any meaning independent. Now, uh, I wrote this very intentionally. I didn't say they must be joined with other words to have meaning. Obviously, the word and or if or but, no, those have meaning. We can look them up in the dictionary and define them, but they're not meaningful on their own. You know, they re grammatically 
require other words to surround them, unlike man, dog, elephant, you know, all that good stuff that, you know, it was very basic, obviously, if you only use the one word, but they convey an idea on their own and doesn't, you know, and what, you know, it's, uh, this pen and this pencil, you know, now the word and serves a purpose and it becomes meaningful in uniting these, um, that type of thing, okay? Uh, as a categorical word then, alone cannot be joined to God, for it would mean God is solitary. So if we use the word alone in this categorical sense where it has an independent meaning uh, outside of the other words it's attached to, then it would mean God is solitary. But alone can be used sin categorically, since it then derives its meaning from the other words it is attached to. And I think the example Aquinas uses is it's helpful for understanding this distinction here. So if we, as Aquinas has this example that if we say Socrates alone writes, that doesn't mean Socrates is alone when he writes, but that he is the only one writing. You see that difference. Um, whereas if that word in the sentence was used categorically, Socrates alone writes, it would have to mean that Socrates is alone while he writes. But no, in this case, alone is being used sin categorically. It's deriving its meaning uh, from the other words. In, in other words, we don't just read this in this sentence. You can't just read the word alone on its own in order to understand how that word is being used. You have to attach it first to Socrates Okay, but then you have to attach it to rights, and then it becomes clear in the context, because we're using it sin categorically, that the word alone means Socrates is alone writing. He is the only one writing. Okay, I know it's confusing. Um, hopefully that clarifies it a little bit. So it is in this sense, sin categorically, that we use the term for God. So God alone is eternal. Now, that doesn't mean God is alone. Well, he is eternal. It means he is the only one who is eternal. All right, objections answered. Solitude concerning God does not mean a lack of extraneous association. Without an intrinsic association, the divine persons would have absolute solitude, even of the angels, saints, and other creatures, okay? So all that's saying there is that, you know, um, it's talking, essentially getting into the difference between being alone in an internal sense versus external sense. All right, so number two, it is true that we cannot say the Father alone is God. That would be problematic because the Son um, uh, is also God and the Spirit is also God. But when if, you know, if we say that, what we're actually meaning is the Father is that God who alone is God. I know that sounds convoluted, um, but that's what gets around the problem. Because then we're not saying the Father alone is God, as though the Son and Spirit aren't. What we're saying is the Father is the, is the God who is the only God. And that statement is not in contradiction with saying the Son is the God who is the only God, or the Spirit is the God who is the only God. So those statements can all be unified. Those, those don't contradict each other. Whereas if we say the Father alone is God and the Son alone is God, those two statements do contradict. Okay. And then number three, the term God alone is Father can mean that God alone is the person of the Father. It doesn't mean he's the only you know, being who is a Father, right? When we say God alone creates, it does not follow that we mean the Father alone creates any more than it would mean man alone is a mortal rational animal. We, then if we say man alone is a mortal rational animal, we also mean Socrates is a mortal rational animal. So just because Socrates is a man doesn't mean he inherits the characteristics we're assigning to mankind in this first sentence. Okay. Finally, number four, can exclusive diction, in other words, words like alone, only, all that, be joined to the personal term? It seems we can join terms like alone to a person, since in John 17, 3, Jesus prays to the Father that they may know thee, the only true God. A similar example from Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 is the second objection. No one knows the Son but the Father. Number three, it, would, it, would, it does not follow necessarily that if we say the Father alone is God, 
we are excluding the Son or the Spirit. And then finally, number four, the church sings, Thou alone art most high, O Jesus Christ. This is going to be one of my favorite objections here. All right, argument from authority. To say the Father alone is God asserts that the Father is God and that no one but the Father is God. And this cannot be since the Son and Spirit are God. So the answer in this case is we can, you know, to take these two articles really hand in hand, uh, we can join exclusive diction to God as a whole, but we can't join it to the personal terms uh, because then we wind up with that problem like we were just discussing where we say the Father alone is God, as in the Spirit and the Son were not. Okay? Argument in the phrase, the Father alone is God, if alone is used categorically to mean solitary, it is false. But if we use it sin categorically, it can be thought about in several ways. It can mean that the Father is the only Father who is God, and that's true. However, if we mean it to say, he who alone is called the Father is God, that's false. Okay, so again, we have to kind of parse things down to say something meaningful. And then, once again, we kind of give allowance for times where language might be used imprecisely in other writings or in the church. There are times when the phrase, the Father alone is God, is used in Scripture or an authentic work of the church. In these cases, we must not be overly literal and understand it in the true way mentioned above. And I already kind of explained how that works uh, a little bit ago in this video. All right, objections replied. Uh, number one and two, these quotes are not meant to apply to the Father alone, but they apply to the entire Trinity. That kind of goes back to that point that, you know, the... John 17, 3 and Matthew 11 are trying to give us a very precise Trinitarian theology, okay? I am speaking in narrative, right? Okay, number three, the exclusive diction taken in the sense would require the Father and Son to differ in suppositum, to not differ in suppositum, which is false. What was that objection? Uh, yeah, I think that's one where my brain kind of got stuck. Did I, oh yeah, I did read that. Okay, and then, this is the one I mentioned is kind of my favorite because if you're a Catholic, you know exactly where this is going because we still sing this hymn today at Mass. And the line in the hymn, it does say, Thou alone, or you, you know, we sing today, you alone are the most high, Jesus Christ. And then the very next line is, With the Holy Spirit and the glory of God the Father. So it's it's a absurd objection, and I can only assume Aquinas included it because someone somewhere was uh, trying to get a cheap shot in by hoping people wouldn't realize what a very obvious mistake was being made there. All right, so that's it. Uh, we've got one more in the general section on, uh, let's just uh, collapse this here to see where we are, and then the divine persons taken absolutely, and then we will get into the particular, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So I will be back uh, hopefully a bit sooner than I was in between 30 and 31 with 32, uh, but until then, I'm Ben Moore, and I will talk to you later. Goodbye.